that's if no other question, or rather, any questions? No? And we'll talk about this. Well, let's introduce it. Let's actually finally start talking about it. What's anatomy? What's physiology? What's, uh, how are we organized? What kind of systems are we made up? And then from there we get into things we need to live. <coughs> Functions we need to have in our body that we can't live. And then we have things we need from the outside world given to us that we can survive. And we'll talk about this concept of homeostasis, which I like, and uh, feedback mechanisms. And then a little bit on anatomical position, some terms and uh, so forth. So a lot of that you have to unfortunately just do the study. Anatomy is the study of structure, the physical parts that we can see, that we can touch. The table, the chair, the elbow, the nose, the heart. The physiology is how it works. Oh, the heart pumps this many times a minute. Each time it pumps this much blood. How much is that per minute? That's physiology. The parts of the heart, the chambers, the flaps, all that, that's anatomy. Very important concept that structure dictates function. If you're sitting crooked, you can, the blood can't go to the brain so nicely, you can't think so straight. Whatever the structure is will dictate what it can do. The heart looks like a pump, it has chambers in the muscle around it, it squeezes it, that squeezes blood. If the heart would look different like a brain, it could not squeeze blood. <coughs> you know, the Eiffel Tower, that's the one in Paris, uh, is made supposedly like, the structure is like the bone on the inside of us. The way the inside parts of the bone look, the cancellous bone, we'll talk about that. But that's why I put that off. Because it's a very strong, solid structure, tall, but minimalistic in weight. Although, of course, it's heavy, it's the Eiffel Tower, but it's not like a concrete building out of metal, you know, full fledged metal or concrete. It's got a lot of in between spaces that don't weigh nothing. And so, a lot of our bones made up, uh, the, this is modeled after our bone. Well, that structure dictates function. When we look at the body, we look at a structural organization. We'll, what that means is we look from a small piece, the smallest we can think of, all the way to who we are. So when we look and analyze, you know, we want to look at smaller and smaller things to understand them. That's sort of the, sort of the <laughs> science thing behind everything. Um, uh, when we look at the smallest pieces, we look at atoms. And now we go even smaller than that. But for us, that's fine. Atoms is the smallest piece, the smallest little little particles that make up the universe. They are they're all different types, and then they make up all the universe when we combine them. And the molecules is when we combine them, these little small particles. We make water, H2O, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. So we'll get to a whole chapter we talk about that. That's next, that's a Wednesday. It's a chemical level, that's the smallest one. And then from there we make some cells. We make living structures. Cells are the smallest living structure. That's very important. Cells are the smallest living things in us. And around us too. Bacteria, some bacteria are single cells. We have 75 trillion cells. Whoa, that's a lot. We'll talk about that. So a lot of different cells, and then the different cells come together and make fabrics, like muscle fabrics or nerve fabrics. The fabric is not a good word, but the tissues, different, different types of these cells coming together looking things. So one of the tissues is the brain, the nervous system. is a <coughs> distinct type of a tissue. Muscles are distinct tissue types. And then you've got bone and blood and tendons and skin. And there's a few more different types, two more different types that make all the other stuff up. So we'll, it's a little abstract, but we'll talk about that and we'll get us, uh, you know, into more understanding of it. And then from there, we go to make an organ, like we make a blood vessel, or we make a whole muscle, or a whole bone, and, and, and organs perform a specific function and they're made up of different types of tissues. 
So the heart's an organ. Its job is very specific. It pumps blood. A blood vessel channels blood. A muscle <coughs> contracts to move bones, to make us move around. And then if you look like the cardiovascular system, you got a heart that pumps the blood. You got all the vessels that the blood goes through. The heart's an organ. The blood vessel's an organ. Together, it's an organ system. So that's an organ level. So that's an organ system consists of different organs that work together closely. So they make the cardiovascular system work. And then we got all these organs, organ systems coming together and make an organism. And that's us. <coughs> So from small to large, chemical, cellular, tissue, organ, organ system, organism. And then that brings me to all the systems. We'll talk about all the systems a little bit. Those are kind of interesting. So the integumentary system is our skin. That's the covering on the outside of the body. That's one function that that skin has is very protective. It protects the deeper tissues from injury. So you can bang into things, it doesn't bleed. That's remarkable. We don't think about it because it just happens. But that's pretty good. Also, we can scratch. I don't just bleed and the skin gets open and everything comes in. So skin is a very, very important uh, immune system, keeping the bad stuff out. It's the largest organ in our body. It's nice to tend it nicely. We have to pay attention to it. Skin makes vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important. We take vitamin D pills because we don't get enough sunlight anymore that reacts with the skin that then makes vitamin D because we got the smartphones and we sit inside all the time. And they tell us outside is dangerous because of cancer. But vitamin D is also very, very important. And not everybody is able to take a supplement most of us can take it in the supplement, but some people don't assimilate the nutrients from the supplement as well. That's one they've been testing a lot. That is also very closely related with muscle and bony stuff like pain, fibromyalgia. It's very deep, apparently. So if you have fibromyalgia, if you've got like an achy pain all over the place, checking a vitamin D is a good thing. See if that's low. It's also linked to cancers and stuff like that. And then we have a lot of receptors in the skin. And what receptors do is they transduce a form of energy into an electrical energy. So they're like, if you poke the skin, you feel that you got poked. Oh, well, how, how do you know that? Because there is a receptor in the skin that says, if it pokes me, I'm going to fire an earth to the brain. And the receptor is right here, so the brain will know, well, it's right here where you got poked. There's stuff like pain, there's pressure, that's a pressure. There's temperature, there's touch also, those different ones. So all these receptors in there that correspond, that relate us to the outside world. So that's an interesting, important thing. So the skin's an important boundary from the inside to the outside world, but also a connector to the experiencing the outside world. And then we got glands, we all kind of sweat and stink once in a while, right? So, sweat glands create sweat. And then we also have oil glands, and every oil gland feeds into a hair follicle. So you got some hair on the body, even if you don't have hair, you still have hair on the body. And, and, and each, oil, each hair has an oil gland going into it, and it makes the, you know, it's, <clears throat> it makes it a little oily. You see it in the hair, if you don't wash the hair long enough, it gets all greasy. That's kind of that. Some of that. No. Integumentary system. <clears throat> Skeletal system. Well, that's my favorite, or one of my favorites. What is that's the bones? Look, all the bones. So what do the bones do? They hold us upright. <coughs> Without bones, you're they know then gravity takes over. You can't stand. So that's important to have bones. They protect, so they support the body. They protect body organs, like the skull protects the brain. The ribcage protects the lungs. Even the hip has protective capabilities for the 
you know, for the or inner organs that are down here, the gut and the reproductive system and all that. Also, skeletal bones, you know, you can think of the extremities easily on that. They create a framework so you can have a muscle attaching. Well, a muscle attached here, that muscle goes up to here, and if it contracts, you bend your elbow. So that's cool. So it creates movement. Framework for muscle to attach and then cause movement. And then another unrelated sort of function is the, um, well, two of them. One is the fact that the bone makes blood cells. All blood cells types are made within bone. That's white blood cells and red blood cells. And even platelets, those things you might not even know about. When you bleed, they make sure you don't bleed out. The platelets. We'll talk about those long time from now. Well, it comes faster than I think, actually. Then, and the next, the last thing that I want to touch on here is, is the, oops, the bone, bone store minerals. Mainly the calcium, what comes to mind on that. So that's where, well, calcium is a very important element in our body. It, I, if you don't have calcium, no muscle will contract. So that's kind of important to have a really nice steady flow in the, in the bloodstream of that. You know, heart's a muscle, you know, so, so very, very important. There are many, many other functions too. Nerve impulse and stuff like that. I mean, neuro trans neurotransmitter release and things like that. So calcium needs to be very, very leveled in the bloodstream. The bone is made of calcium, all of it. So if we have cells that go into the bone and say, oh, we need a little more in the bloodstream, let's chip up a little bit from what we have here in the reservoir. Perfect, no problem. We have a great reservoir of calcium right in there. So mineral storage. The problem comes when people get, have you heard of osteoporosis? Brittle bone people, when we're old. That's when these calciums are depleted and there's not enough calcium in there. And that's when the, when, when the grandma steps off the curb and then collapses because the, 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 the height from the, down the curb was enough force to break the bone that wasn't strong enough anymore, and then she falls. So it's not like she falls and then the bone breaks, or he. It's the bone break and then the patient falls. And so that's osteoporosis, porose bone, brittle bone. It has to do with this calcium. And they say that that's a disease that comes on when you're an adult, but is actually created when we're a juvenile. That's why I need to talk about it. Because when we're young, we're putting calcium into the bone. When we get older, post 35 or so, we're taking it out. So the more we put in, the more we got to take out. If we eat foods and drink bad things that just don't put it in when we're young, like a lot of meat and a lot of sodas, especially carbonated, caffeinated, Coca-Cola type really stuff, it doesn't get deposited. And so the more we do that as growing up, the more that that diet is not, also not varied and has calcium in it, the less it's being put in and deposited. So we don't have as much. Of course, we can also then do things to prevent it. Like we can have weight-bearing exercise, walking and not just sitting around and things like that. Or eat, of course, calcium throughout life and green leafy vegetables and things that, that we provide. Those big almond calcium pills that they say take, I'm not so sure. They have some, it's not all that clear if that's all that great in terms of absorption of the calcium into the body. That's always the question we need to ask, you know. All right, that's the skeletal system. The muscle system is very closely related and that uh, uh, manipulates our environment. It moves us around. Locomotion is moving. Motion here, it's moving us around like a locomotive. So we can touch things, we can grab things, we can walk around, we can, we, can, we can make facial expressions. Also, we can stand upright without falling down. That's posture. I can ride on the bones or I can put my muscles together. And if we're really cold, we can do jumping jacks and it gets us warm real fast. So we produce a lot of heat with muscles. When it says movement, where is the movement? Allows manipulating the atom. I also, when they go to food, for example, there's also muscle involved. Movement of food through the body, that's muscular. It's smooth muscle. We don't think about it. 
Oh, the heart is also muscle. So have this system too. So we have a few different muscle types that we gotta talk about. Even blood vessels have muscles in them to make them smaller or wider. Constrict or dilate, they call that. Interesting, my favorite system. One of my favorite systems. I also one of my favorite systems, nervous system. It's a very fast acting control system of the body. So you got this brain, and then you got these wires, these wires, like, like wires in the wall wires. And they, they go from one place to the next place. They go down the spinal cord and they go out into the body on these wires and then they go to all the different muscle cells. And they connect the body to the brain. Sometimes it just goes to the spinal cord, but most of the time it goes to the brain. And so the brain is this computer thing that controls everything, what's going on in the body. And then the wires go and talk to the body and wherever they go to, then something will happen. So the brain talks to that. But it's like a telephone, <coughs> like a, an old telephone. So it's very physical, actually, even though it's fast. Have you ever hit your funny bone? That's fast, right? That's, the, that's that shooting thing. That's the electricity going through it. Um, and so with that system, we have a way to respond to things that change on the inside of the body or on the outside of the body. I can measure. Things that go to the bloodstream, for example, and I say, ooh, something's a little off. Let's change something. Or I can like have to swerve out out of the car, with the car out of the lane because the other one is in that lane or whatever. And before I realize what happened, my body did it. And then I can curse. And then I get jittery. So that's how fast that thing is. But as soon as I swerved out, it's gone. The impulse is gone. So it's very fast acting, not long lasting. Short in duration. The endocrine system is your hormones. It's a very similar system. But that's for the slow stuff. So when you swerve out with your car and you curse this the storm and then a half minute later you go like, well, how do you gotta drink so much coffee? Because you're all jittery. It wasn't real bad. That's the endocrine system. Dripping little chemicals into the bloodstream and the bloodstream then goes into all the parts of the body and talks to the cells that way chemically so that's very slow the freaking chemicals have to go to the bloodstream and travel there and travel there and then somewhere they get to work it's not like a, a wire fast talking to one specific place so that system is also controlling the body but in a slow and ongoing manner that's why the swerving out is fast and furious the jitters will stay around for a while. The jitters are going through here. Those cysts, the adrenaline, you can't get that out of the bloodstream that fast. There's one more thing. Oh, and to finish up the nervous system, actually, the way that the brain talks to the body is through the wires, and the electricity goes through the wires. But at the end of the place where the nerve, the, the nerve goes to the cell that it talks to, it releases a chemical. That's that neurotransmitter. Have you heard of neurotransmitter? Like GABA or, you know, all the, nore, the serotonin reuptake inhibitor, the brain stuff, all that. That has to do with these neurotransmitter chemicals. So in some ways, it's like the brain talks to the end part of the nerve, and then their chemical goes and talks to the cell to make it do something. In the endocrine system, the chemical, it's also a chemical, it's the same thing really, but the chemical doesn't go, the nerve doesn't talk to the end point, the chemical just gets dripped into the blood and then the blood travels through the system and then it goes to the places where it needs to go that way. And the places where it needs to go, they call that target, the targets, where's the target? Have you heard of the thing, don't kill the messenger? It's the same thing. The chemical is the messenger the target is the cell that needs to do something to change. Like take a sugar into the blood, into the cells because we just ate a big sugar meal. And so the target is the executor. So the chemicals sometimes, similar chemicals can do different things in the body. We'll get to that later. I know, I'm starting to lose it. Sorry about that. But that's the difference. Endocrine system, nervous system. Very similar systems. That brings us to the heart, the cardiovascular system. So 
We have blood vessels that transport blood, which carries oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrients, and hormones, those chemicals, and waste throughout the whole body and distribute everything through the body. It's like a freeway system. I think of a freeway system, distribution freeway system. And the heart is in the middle and it pumps everything. There you go. It's actually very interesting. It's like two pumps in one. One, it pumps in one part of the blood, comes in on one side and it goes to the lungs, and then it comes back from the lungs, goes back to the heart, and then it pumps again and it goes to the whole body. Because the lungs pick up oxygen. There you go. The lungs pick up oxygen and bring the oxygen to the rest of the body because every cell needs oxygen. We need nutrients and we need oxygen and then we can make energy and energy makes the cells stay alive. That's why oxygen is so important. And the respiratory system, right there, the heart's right here, it just pumps the blood right over to the lungs, very short. It picks up the oxygen and then it goes back to the heart and the rest it, then it pumps, the heart pumps the blood through the whole body and brings the oxygen and all the other stuff to the rest of the tissue. So really cool. So it gets oxygen and it also removes carbon dioxide because when you take food and you take oxygen and a lot of magic and you make energy, that one of the side products you make is carbon dioxide. And we can't use that in the body, we gotta get rid of it. So we breathe it out. And then we breathe it to the trees, and the trees make oxygen again, and then we cut the trees, and then we're in trouble. Oh, wait, that was another class. But that's how that goes, right? Um, the small little air sacs, they have little small air sacs, like grapes on a vine, they look. They don't show them here. They call them alveoli. The grapes on a vine are alveoli. And so the air comes into these small little pockets and sits there and we breathe that into the lungs. And on the other side is the blood and the oxygen just goes right through it and it goes into the blood. It's really cool. I still can't kind of visualize it, but it works that way. I skipped the lymphatic system. When, um, well, when we look at the cardiovascular system, the heart pumps that oxygenated blood through the whole body. And but somehow that oxygen needs to go into the cell, into the tissue, outside of the bloodstream, into the tissue. How is he going to do that? So at the tissue level, like everywhere in the body locally, there's very leaky, leaky blood vessels and all that blood sort of diffuses out into the tissues. And so it's all liquidy, watery under here. And, and, and so once it's, that liquid is in the tissue, we need to bring it back to the blood vessels to then bring it back to the heart to pump it again through the system so it doesn't get all, you know, troubled. So we have a second system to help with that because the heart system is not fully, the cardiovascular system is not fully capable of picking up all that leaked fluid from the tissues. And that's where the lymphatic system comes in. And actually if you have, if, you know, the lymphatic system is interesting because it's one that spreads cancer in the body. And so sometimes people have to take lymph nodes out. Like you see that with the breast cancer, they have to take lymph nodes out in the axilla, and then the arm gets bigger. They have to have sleeves, compression sleeves. What you see in there is the fact that the cardiovascular system <coughs> squeezes out the blood into the tissues, picks them back up, but it's not fully efficient. The lymphatic system, what it is, is these, these finger ended, these like, um, what do they call that? close-ended like structures that feed into the tissue and they have slits that go into the out inside and fluid f comes in from them and it picks all that excess fluid up and it brings it back by the heart it dumps it into the cardiovascular system and so it helps the cardiovascular system pick up all the fluid that are squeezed out to bring it back <coughs> to the heart so it's really sweet and what it also does in that moment it has these lymph nodes and it filters the lymph, which is that fluid. Once it's in that system, it's called lymph, not blood. But it's the same stuff, except for some elements. It gets dumped back into the blood. But it, it cleans it, and it gets rid of crap, gets rid of debris. It filters it, so a lot of white blood cells are sitting in here. And that's unfortunately also the way that the cancer can spread. But, you know, that's, that's the one negative thing about that.
White blood cells, when you think white blood cells, you think immune system. B cell, T cell, I don't know if you heard all of these things, but immune system. Immune system is the stuff that doesn't make you sick. It's the stuff you go like, why did you get, why did I get sick and you didn't get sick? Well, because your immune system cells were working a little better because, I don't know, you had a, two party nights or something and we're all like run down and then you just catch the cold. But have you noticed that? It's like, you know, you say catch a cold. It's like not everybody in the room gets the cold when they have a cold going around. How is that? Hmm. So that's the immune system. That's our constitution that way. All right. So that's pretty good. Respiratory we did. Oh, and if you have questions, just stick up your hand or shout it out. We'll get interactive. Whoa, from food to poop, that's next. Food digestive system. So that's the system that breaks the food down into small particles. So we eat bread or whatever, and we go break it down into a small particle that can be absorbed into the blood. So, hello. Digestion means breaking down food. Absorption means when the, when the particles go into the bloodstream. And then from there, once into the bloodstream, actually the stuff, most of it goes to the liver for processing, and then it gets distributed through the whole body, so the cells get food. And one of the things we want from the food is energy. So every cell needs energy. Every person needs to eat. It's the same. You think of a cell as a little small person that needs all of the stuff that we need. And then the poop is when we have stuff we don't use, we just poop it up. And then we have a system that we drink things with. So that's a system that actually, well, we don't. We drink, it goes to the blood, and then the urinary system, the kidney system, filters the blood um, and, and regulates the water, how much water is in the blood that way. And so it filters it, gets rid of stuff that we waste that we don't need, that a liquid waste, and we pee that out. And so that's the system that makes our pee. Nitrogenous waste is what we get from protein. And by doing that, by regulating the water, it also regulates our electrolytes, the Gatorade. Have you, do you know Gatorade, right? Or the emergencies or all that kind of stuff. It's, these are electrolytes, those are ions. Those are um, um, salt type things in our body that are charged molecules. And they go through the system, they help with <laughs> things like nerve impulses. So they're very, very important. And when we sweat, we sweat all of that out. And when we replenish with water, we don't get them in, we get just regular water in. And so in the 70s, in Florida, they played football, and the Gators, I guess, didn't win. And so at some point, they came out with some solution that was a saltier solution that was sort of similar to you know, what we sweat out to replenish. And then they all of a sudden, they had more energy. And so they, because in you know, Florida you sweat a lot, and so all that salt goes out. And so replenishing that really made a difference. That's when Gatorade was born. Um, and so <clears throat> the electrolytes is that solution in the system, and that's a very, very important for nerve impulse and stuff like that. And so inside our body, you can uh, control how strong an electrolyte solution is, for example, by how you manage your water regulation. Getting rid of all the water, you're gonna have more concentrations of different things. Depends if you get rid of it or not. pH is your acidity, acid-base balance. pH, have you heard of pH? <coughs> That's very, very important in the body that the pH is balanced, not too much. So that also happens in the kidneys, a lot of uh, regulation. So the kidneys are pretty cool, but for now they clean our blood, they get, make pee out of stuff that we don't need and regulate our water. Also blood pressure, it should be here too, regulate blood pressure. And that brings us to the reproductive system. And the overall function is you know, to have fun, but to also to make offsprings. And so we hopefully will get to that chapter. We, we do the class by chapters, uh, not by regions. That's how we do it in here. Uh, and all, often we don't get that far, but I have a chapter on, on, on repro and on embryology that I like to get to this semester. So we have the different, um, get, the different, um, the testes in the male, they make the sperm and they make the sex hormones. 
and then the system consists of glands and ducts that make the you know make the viable sperm get into the female reproductive system and in the female and the woman and you have the ovaries that make the egg so that's sperm and egg need to come together to make a human back out or an offspring <coughs> for humans as humans um, and then in the female we also have besides the uh, also the glands and and the, um, the duct stuff we also have structures that help the fetus grow with the uterus and then also have the baby be viable and get you know more growing as it comes out and that's the memory glands and so that encompasses all that so it's making making the offspring having the offspring and then nurturing the offspring till it's a uh, feasible uh, in the world <clears throat> and from that level we don't have to have be fed uh, by the mother that long but humans have a long long period till they're really able to be on their own compared to other animals we're very slow that way which is great we like our moms we don't want to get out of the house too fast I like the birds get up get up all right well that's our those are the systems and then we have a few things that we need to maintain life to keep life alive. One thing we need, we need boundaries. We, 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 I mean, that's not a good topic right now necessarily, but some fences make good neighbors. Not walls, but some fences, like, you know. Uh, but, anyway. but in the body, we will need some boundaries. Now they can be open and closed, there's doors. So there's not like, just don't come in things. But if we don't have an inside and an outside environment that's distinct, we're just a block. If we don't have a skin, which is a boundary, we cannot live. We have to have that integrity. If we just do it, every cell has that. You think of the cell, again, the cell is the smallest unit of life. So when you think of these things, every cell needs to have these kind of things. We need movement. We need, we need, uh, uh, well, for us, we need to move around. We need food going in and out of the, of the body. We need to be able to manipulate objects to get things to us. We're not trees. We can't just stand there and at some level magically take care of all of that. We have to figure out how to get food into this thing. So movement is very important. Responsiveness is also very important, or irritability. It's not like you're pissed off. It's irritability. It means your tissue response when you do something. So if we have the ability to sense change in the environment, we can react to it. If we do not, we do not have that environment, that ability. There's, there's some pathologies, like people don't feel pain in their joints, and they end up walking on the sides of their ankles, and they twist their ankles immediately, because there's no reactivity like that. So that's very, very important. Digestion, yeah, we, makes sense. We need to be able to break down the... The, the food into particles that we can assimilate, that the absorb, assimilate, absorb, same thing, uh, that we then can use to make energy, to make building blocks, to make muscle, and so forth. So some foods we have for energy, other foods we use to make building blocks, and then other foods we need as helpers, like vitamins and minerals, to aid the process. Metabolism is all the chemical reactions that occur in the body cells, inside the body. When it says inside the body cells, that means inside our body. <coughs> That's where the life is in the body. So we need to break down complex substances into simpler ones that we can use. So we take a piece of meat, we chew it, eat it up, or protein, and we get a chain of amino acids, and all the amino acids are broken down. Then we then the smallest building blocks, those are amino acids. And we'll learn that on Wednesday, no, on Monday next week. But when they are then the smallest one, we can take them into the cell, and then the cell can use them to make new things. It's like Legos. Like Legos. I, I, I can tell I have a granddaughter, huh? I'm playing a lot of Legos. Um, breaking down, making down the small ones, nutrients option. And ultimately, of course, a big piece about metabolism is to make energy. And we might as well say now in the body, energy, the fuel in the body, that molecule we use for that is called ATP. We'll have much more of that on Wednesday. You'll learn that whole molecule on Wednesday. You don't have to memorize all of it, but you'll learn why it's important. So this is actually interesting. Already a little bit of chemistry. Breaking down molecules from large to small is called catabolism. 
making smaller, making things from small molecules to larger ones called anabolism. Oh, anabolic steroids right there. That's where that word comes from, the building of it. Uh, what's, what's nice about it, whenever we have metabolism, whenever we have chemical processes, we have heat that gets created. And heat is lost in the process. Oh, actually, it's, it's said to be lost in the process. We can use it because when it's cold, <laughs> we want that heat. So we, we, when it says lost as a chemical thing, it's not lost. The body utilizes everything. All right, so that's metabolism. Then we got a poop. Excretion. If we cannot remove the waste from the body, well, it's toxic. There was this interesting joke. There was this, like, this, this hot pair. I think it was a parent of a, of a person who did a seminar, and he said, and he said, they had a Thanksgiving, and they got the par his parents got sick, called the doctor, the doctor told them to take an emodium and something against, against throwing up. So the system wants to get rid of stuff by throwing up and getting diarrhea, and then, and then, and then we don't like that. Of course, it's a pain in the butt. So we have a thing, we get something to stop the throwing up and stop the pooping. But guess who gets toxic? So that's, you know, we got to think of it a little bit that way. So the removing of the waste is very important. Good, let's see. Oh, and then we got to make new things, yeah. Reproduction. Necessary is to stay in life, the cell or organism level. We need, well, the gametes, the sperm and the egg, for us, they have to come together. They're not complete cells. They're like half cells, and when they come together, they become a full cell, and then they start dividing and they always, when they divide in cells, they say we make two daughter cells because they both look the same. And then more and more goes on. And then growth. If we, if we do not increase in size, we still stay the way we came out. That's not going to work. And then every, it's like a Russian, the, the, the doll thing, you know? the babushkas. So growth is an increase in size, also accomplished by an increase in number of cells. So we get taller, we get more cells accumulated as we get taller. Good, that's what we need as functions from our body to make it in this world. And then we have a few things we need to survive. We need food. Yeah, that is definitely self-actualization, very important, but that we're talking about food right now. So it's baseline. Uh, but then we go up the ladder, of course. So no food, no energy, no life. As simple as that. We have macronutrients and we have micronutrients we need to eat. That's McDonald's, that's the green salad. No, that's nasty, but I gotta still do it. Carbs, protein, and fats are sort of our macronutrients, the bigger things. Those are, you know, we, we eat very refined things. We get those, but we get them in a refined way. What that means to the body is just it goes very fast into the system, and every process, you know, has to speed up. And of course, that's really bad for the insulin, and that's the diabetes problem. Uh, micronutrients are my, minerals, minerals and vitamins, and those are important to help chemical processes get, get done in the body. Like, like the, you know, enzymes. Have you heard of enzymes? The enzymes, like the digestive enzymes, they help you digest your food more. Because they go and make, they break down molecules and, 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 or make molecules. And vitamins are part of the enzymes to make them work. So if you don't have a vitamin, that enzyme just won't work as well. And that's where that becomes a problem. So they're very small nutrients. We don't need much of it. They're not here to make a building. They're not here to give us energy. They're here to help us do all the other stuff. I know, we'll talk about that in nutrition a lot more. I have a whole chart of what vitamins for what and where you find it. And it's, well, it's important because we then, we, did you take vitamins, you know, and then it's like, um, yeah, well, what do you think of taking vitamins? And it's a whole discussion. It's always the best if we get it in food, whatever we can get in food. We'll talk about that. And you can ask me if you have questions. And water is also a nutrient. It's very important. Without water, without hydration, <coughs> you can't have a chemical process. We talked about that the other day. How much water to drink? Oh, I still got to go there. I have a little more here. So nutrients are here. And then oxygen. We talked about oxygen also. 
to make energy. So oxygen is important. Well, you combine food and oxygen and you make energy. And then we need normal body temperature. Too low will stop or slow down metabolic reactions. Too fast will make them you know, go too fast. Or too hot will make the protein denature break down. That's why fever can be a problem. <coughs> but in kids now, they get the fever spiking up very high. Like one was a few years ago, it was 104, but they didn't give the kid medication at the hospital because the kid was still alert. And so that, there's more factors going in because they say, some of it they say, well, don't do all that on your own. You know, have the professionals help you with, but that's interesting. Because they say it helps get, kill the bug faster and the fever is only a problem in a baby or in a, in, a, in a small child that high when the kid's lethargic because then it's in the brain. I know, food for thought. Don't just execute on me saying it, but I was shocked when the, page, the student few years walked in and said, oh yeah, I went to the hospital, 104, they didn't give him pills. So, that's one of that, yeah. Uh, well, a fever is an interesting thing, a fever, why would you have a fever in the body? Any idea? When you have a, you raise in body temperature, some processes that make, make you sick in the body, they don't work as well. So some bacteria get kicked out by the fever, the pyrogens. They can kill, they can kill part of your thing. So the fever is a reaction of the body to get rid of stuff. It's almost like barfing or pooping, diarrhea. It's trying to rectify something. So having a fever is a really good thing. Having no fever and being sick, then you know you're in trouble. Because your body's not reacting. The fever is your body reacting. So that's just, you know, we gotta I want us to think of those kind of things. The body has a reason why it does something. Often when it doesn't respond, then it's dead. When it responds and reacts, then it's, it's very alive. That's why the baby, the fever grew up and down real fast, within very fast time. So fever is an interesting one. Atmospheric pressure is, what's, what's that? That is the force exerted on the surface of the body by the weight of the air. Oh, great. Well, if you go and go into scuba diving you go down and the pressure increases really heavily every meter you go down you feel that pressure coming in on you it's the same going up in, 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 in height so low pressure <clears throat> what it means for us is low pressure has not as many oxygen molecules in them <coughs> and so our body needs to be able to pick up more oxygen molecules from less in the air so we end up more making more red blood cells because the red blood cells in the body carry the oxygen around. So that's when you go up to Colorado and you train for the Olympics and you be like in high altitude. And then increased high pressure, like at sea level, is when you have more molecules condensed in a given space of air. And so you also have more oxygen molecules. So in the body, as a reaction, the body often then produces a little bit less has a little bit less amount of red blood cells because we have more in the atmosphere, so it goes around the body easier, gets absorbed into the body easier. So pressure is very important for, particularly for oxygen, about the, the breathing stuff for us. Yeah, if it's too low pressure, never mind, we can't do it. All right, what time is it? That brings me now to homeostasis. Anybody understand homeostasis from the video? So when you look at this body, it's, it's, it's pretty same on the inside. It can be warm on the outside or cold, but the inside temperature is always pretty much the same. So homeostasis means, homeo means the same, stasis means standing still. That means the inside of the body is not changing, even though the outside is changing. The inside stays the same. I have reactions in the body that make it that it can stay the same. If it's too warm out there, I start sweating. If it's too cold out there, I start shivering. But the inside of the body stays the same. And so that's homeostasis. The ability to maintain a relatively stable internal body environment, like the temperature, 
even though the outside is changing all the time. And that creates a dynamic state of equilibrium and always balancing out. Sweat and shivering, sweat and shivering. Um, but that is also true for other things like calcium in the blood. Uh, what else comes to mind right now? Uh, I don't have anything in mind right now. But you know, a lot of things will be chat will be done. Oh, hormones, hormonal level in the blood, all that kind of stuff. Sodium levels, uh, the chemicals. Uh, we can measure all things and see where what's the what's the level that we want? What's the balancing level? What's the range of calcium we want in the blood, for example? Or the sugar, the blood glucose level. If we get out of balance we got to figure out what to do to bring it back in balance. And so if it's too hot outside, we're going to put down the AC in the body and start sweating. If it's too cold, we start shivering. So what we do is we do almost like the opposite. If it's too cold, we make more heat to make it okay warm again. If it's too hot, we make more cold. Sweating makes it colder. So that slime is like we do the opposite of what the stimulus is, and they call that the negative feedback. So when you see the word negative here, you could say opposite. I prefer, actually, yeah, I prefer opposite almost because negative has this negative connotation to it. It's not bad. It's actually good. We want it that way. Because when we have a calcium that's out of hand in the blood, we don't order blood sugar. We don't want that blood sugar to go up and up and up and up and up and up, higher and higher. Nothing's being done about it. We need the body to react and say, whoa, we're way out of balance. We figured out we're out of balance with the blood sugar. What are we going to do about it? That's where the brain comes in. And then we're going to have, in the blood sugar discussion, we get insulin squeezed, squeezed into the blood sugar, into the blood, and then the blood sugar goes away. In this discussion, it gets too hot, we pick up too hot, the brain says, what the heck are we going to do about that? We start sweating. The glands are starting to work and get all that water pushed out. And with the sweat, the heat goes out. So when we look at a negative feedback loop, or a, we can look at the, at the homeostatic control system, this is a fundamental way things work. Same with neurology. Neurology will work the same way in many ways, in many aspects. We have something that picks up. We have a stimulus and something that picks up that something's out of balance. Again, too hot. The receptor says it's too hot. I'm burning up. We have to send that signal of too hot to a place where we can make a decision. That's the brain, most likely. And then there the brain goes like, well, it's too hot. You better start sweating. And the brain goes, to all the sweat gland and says, start sweating now. And it turns on the sweating and we get colder. So we have a stimulus, the heat. We have a receptor that picks up the heat. We got an input. The information needs to travel. We haven't talked about that. It needs to travel to the control system. There is another word, afferent pathway. We're going to talk about that again and again and again. If you don't pick it up now, that's cool. But it's all here. Brain, and then we have an exit pathway. I call that the exit, the efferent. I know, lots of words. And the effector is the sweat gland, and we're going to be controlled and have a response. These are all the same control pieces of a feedback loop. Something gets picked up inside or outside the body. We need to transmit the information to the control, to the computer. The computer needs to make a decision. We need to send a signal out to have a response or reaction. So that stuff I need you to have the step-by-step -step sort of in your system. That makes sense? Okay. And then we got the positive feedback mechanism, and that's when the stimulus gets enhanced. Most of the time, that's not a good thing. It's like you got a fever, you gotta have a higher fever, a higher fever, and at some point your head will explode. So we don't want that. Most of the time, that is <clears throat> cancer stuff, pathology. The more and more and more and more. Except we have a few places, a baby coming out, 
that uterus needs to contract until that baby's out, and we don't know how much that means, but that just goes until it's out. And then it stops. We also have the same with the milk letdown, a little bit brings it on, and then more and more comes, and then of course, until the stop stimulus comes in. Um, and the other one that we have is the blood clotting, where we have a cut in a blood vessel, we need to patch that, patch that, patch that blood vessel until it's closed, and it's not an opposite. So that's that's another place but very few places in the body have you do have this positive or reinforcing feedback mechanism good that makes sense huh. that also some of the hardest things here and then now that brings us just to the body uh, the language of anatomy and that's uh, pretty much it then um, when we talk anatomy we have to have a specific position we reference everything in because people can lay like that and then you have to still talk about things and you have to be able to 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 use similar terminologies and languages and so we have one position we are using to reference everything in order to accurately describe the body parts and positions and locations and that position is we're standing and we have in our palms forward that's the anatomical position. So the important thing is standing and palms not back, palms forward. Because in the forearm we have two bones, and when we have a palm forward, they are parallel, but when we have a palm back, they cross over. So that makes it harder to describe things. So that's the anatomical position. And then look at that. Then we have regional terms. Like, these are hard because you gotta just go through them a few times. And, 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 but what I would do with this is I look at these terms and go like, frontal, that's the area in the body that we refer to frontal, right here. Okay, we, that's kind of easy to remember. We can do, you walk in the front of your head, you walk into the wall, you already remember it. But then when we get to studying the skull, we have a frontal bone. Ha! Huh. We get the muscle, we have a frontalis muscle. So by learning, going through these terms and learning what they are, the anatomical words for, for these body regions, you already learn a lot of things that will come up and then the next step will be easier. So don't blow this, just do it. This is how you study actually for school. You study really hard early on in the semester and then you cruise through the semester after the second half. Versus you don't study and then you cram at the end. Personal experience. It works way better and your grades are way better because I have so much chest anxiety. I always started my butt off and after about a, a year and a half of Cairo school, I was like, maybe I studied too much. <laughs> and then after the first midterms, I stopped studying so much and I, I still remember a lot. But when I went the opposite way and I don't learn the foundation and I think, yeah, that's boring. And then I pick it up later. I understand. And then I get completely overwhelmed at some point. So I advocate study hard at the beginning, plus at the end of the semester, everybody gets stressed out anyway. And so it's harder to study heavy at the end. But anyway, there is a few terms that are kind of goofy. Cephalic means head. <coughs> Frontal, which is the orbit, is the eye socket. Nasal, that's easy. Buccal is the cheek. We have a muscle called a buccinator, the cheek muscle. Oral is mouth, we got the mental is chin. I don't know why they do chin for that. But we have a mentalis muscle, so we'll learn that then. Cervical, we do that in the back. That's neck part. Cervical refers to neck part. Then the sternum is the chest bone. The axilla is the armpit. The apple is the stomach. The umbilicus is the belly bone. You got that, right? Belly bone. Then pelvis is your hip. Inguinal is your groin area. Although when they say inguinal, they really mean this line, this ligament. Pubic means the genitals. I would argue with that. It's the bone, too. Um, and then we go to this side. The tip of the shoulder means a chromial. That's a new word, very likely. But there's no chromial process. So we got right there. It's deltoid. This is muscle, the arm pocket muscle. So knowing that area, upper arm is a deltoid, that's good to know. Well, the, the area up here, the shoulder, 
upper 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 shoulder. Then this part of this part where the biceps is, is the, the biceps, we call the biceps brachii. So it's a brachial area, or and there's like five muscles with the word brachii in it, so you might as well learn that one. Or maybe four. And, and, and a forearm means anti-brachium. So that's kind of goofy, but that's, you, you know that once you've studied a couple times. Manus means hand. Digital means digit means fingers. Coxa means hip. That's the outside here. Uh, femur means the, the thigh bone. Femur, we, we will have, that's the femur is there. Femoral. Patella means a kneecap. Crural means leg. Nah, that's what we don't use as much, the crural. The crural. But fibula we use a lot. That's a bone on the outside here, down here. So there's a muscle and a bone called the fibula. Fibularis muscle and the fibular bone. And pedal means foot, like pedestrian. You heard of the word pedestrian, right? Ped means foot. P-E-D is the foot. And then the, um, oh, wrist means carpal. That goes to here. Carpal is the wrist. And tarsal is the ankle. The same kind of thing. A wrist and ankle similar. Upper arm, lower leg. Arm, leg, similar, similar construction. So a lot of words are similar. Uh, the back of the head is the occiput. Then in the spine, in the backbone, we have like the, the cervical is the top, the thoracic, wherever that is. Oh. It's labeled thoracic here. See that? The chest area? I, I prefer it on the other side uh, because, because it's the area on the spine that the ribs attach. The ribs attach to the thoracic bone. So here, every time we have a rib, you can go back and you find that's the thoracic part of the back. And then below the rib, on the bottom, is the lumbar, the flank, is the lumbar part. The shoulder blade is the scapula. That's good to know. That's a big bone. Very cool bone. It's almost like the scap, the shoulder blade is the equivalent of the hip bone on the bottom. So we'll talk about that a lot. The scapula, we'll talk about that a lot. At the tailbone end, at the bottom of the spine, that, that part is known as the sacral area. And we have a bone called the sacrum. And the word comes from sacred. More of that later. The butt is the glute. Be like that, the glute. I know I got my little three-year-old. She's like the granddaughter is like shaking the booty. I know it's so funny. <laughs> the peel we did is the foot. The heel bone is the calcaneus. So the heel technical word for that is calcaneal. Calcaneal. And I like the last one. The sole of the foot is known as plantar. Like you plant your foot into the ground. Plant tar. So, a little bit of boring. Do you know what you do with this? Like you, know, you put a sheet of paper on, you write them, and then you check yourself. And then the ones you don't have your highlighted, then you know, you got it. Okay, so that's the regional term. So, where are things in the body? Then we have directional terms. So, those help us explain where are one body structures in relation to an other. So, <clears throat> When somebody's on top of something, like my head is on top of my shoulder, they use the term superior for that. So the first term is the one we use in class mostly, the one they use mostly. Then these two are older terms. So the word cranial or cephalad is also one you can get in the textbook. Um, older maybe. Cephalad, cephal means head. Cranium is the cranium is also the head. So that means more towards the head, and superior really simply just means above. So the patella is above the ankle. I can use it that way. Below means inferior. Or the word caudat is an old word, so you don't have to worry for the test, I just have it for completion. Caudat means tail, so that's towards the tail. That means down here. 
So inferior, superior, very important. Above, below. In front, behind. Anterior is in front. Posterior is behind. Ventral dorsal, we use a little in neurology, so don't, we'll get to that when we get to that. But those are also the older ones of those terms. Ventral, I mean, anterior, posterior. And then we got, <clears throat> towards the midline is medial, midline medial, that makes sense. And then to the outside of the midline is lateral. Medial, lateral. What time is it? Lateral, medial. Then these two terms we use mostly for the extremities, for the arms and legs. Proximal is closer to the attachment side of the extremity into the trunk, and distal is further away. So proximal, like the sh you always have to have two parts to refer one another to. So the shoulder is proximal to the elbow, but the wrist is distal to the elbow. <coughs> Make sense? So closer to the attachment to the trunk or further away. Proximal is closer, distal is further away. And then that deep superficial, that sort of makes sense. On the surface or deep inside the body. Good. Those are those. Two more topics and then we're good. Oh shoot, I've been talking a long time. Sorry about that. Body planes and sections. When you take an MRI or an X-ray also, you get a sliver, you get a two-dimensional picture coming from a three-dimensional space. Like in an X-ray, the whole thing is a whole picture of all of it and then it's condensed in two dimensions all over the wall. An MRI is a slice. But we have to sort of figure out what's the slice, what's the picture? Is it from the side or is it the slice this way? Is it this way? Is it this way? So there's the three different planes. So the sagittal plane, oh wait, where is it? Three different planes. The sagittal plane makes a right and a left out of it. So that's sagittal, right and left. So when you see a picture from the side, that's sagittal in an MRI. We don't use this for action, but for MRI we use these terms. So a sagittal is a left and right. A frontal is a front and back. So when you have a slice that's this way, and you, get, you see an MRI, then you see the back or the lungs or so, that's a frontal section. So it makes a front or a back. They also use that word coronal, for the corona, the crown. That's where they use that from. And then a transverse is a cross. That gives us a top and bottom section. A lot of times in MRIs, like I see spinal MRIs for back stuff, you see a sagittal to show it from the side, and then it goes up and down, and you just go through slides and say, where's the herniated disc or something? And so that's in the transverse. So that's that for that. And um, there's some picture for that. And then last but not least, the body cavities. You think about, you've got a brain in here, you've got a heart, you've got a gut, and it's like if they mix, and we have to learn about function, boundaries, and they're important, and so here we go. We have these different spaces inside our body that have different environments that um, uh, can house different structures. So for example, we have the, 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 the yellow one is the, the posterior, or look here, they, they used to have a dorsal body cavity, that's that you could say posterior body cavity if you're really not needing to learn all these new words. So that is a, a cavity for the brain. Very important to be very, very specific environment. Brain, we cannot have inflammation, we cannot have expansion. There's a skull around it that's gonna squeeze the brain. So we gotta be very careful. So you got a cranial cavity for the brain, you got a spinal cavity also very well protected with bone, and that's for the spinal cord. And then in the front, the anterior portion, the, we have, and look at here, they use the word ventral for that, they use that old term, instead of anterior. But we have a, a top chest area, and that's a lot of air in here. And then we got a gut part, and that's a lot of liquid. 
and so we have a in between a diaphragm so we have a thoracic cavity that's very distinct and different from a abdominal pelvic cavity or an abdominal cavity and then the pelvis is where the hip is but they're pretty much the same because we don't have uh, a separation in between those so that's just some food for thought but that way the different organs can be protected against one another and they don't all intermingle and they don't share things they shouldn't share with one another. The big one to know is liquid, more air. And then the brain's always separate. Very, very, very delicate. Good. Any questions? Except get me out of here.